All right, so I'm here today to give you the flour mills perspective. Um, this is Manel Milling's mission statement. I thought it'd be a great way to start uh, to give you a framework about who we are and what we do and what's important to us. I won't read it word for word, but you'll notice a lot of uh, phrases like quality products, provider of superior service, um, diligent efforts to understand our customers and suppliers. All these things are, are really important for us as a company and we couldn't do it without you guys. So a little bit about Manel Milling. Uh, we've been around for a long time. We were founded in 1886. Um, we have five flour mills, two here in Ohio, one in Faustoria and one in Bucyrus. Um, we also have a mill in Dowagiac, Michigan, uh, one in Mount Olive, Illinois, and one in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, Faustoria and Roanoke, in addition to grinding soft wheat locally, we also rail in hard and spring wheat from out west. Um, we also have nine grain elevators where we handle corn and soybeans in addition to wheat. Uh, we have in Ohio, Troy, Four Acre, Kingston, or Valley Grain. Um, and in Upper Sandusky, we have Menco Grain, which is a collection of four elevators scattered in the area. Uh, we also have an elevator in Mexico, Indiana, and one in West Point, Virginia. Uh, amongst those elevators, we have two unit train loaders, one on the NS, one on the CSX. In West Point, Virginia, we load barges um, that go out to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and we also have two trucking companies that provide transportation for our flour, as well as tractors and trailer hoppers for our grain elevators. We also have a truck repair shop in Faustoria called Class 8 that handles all of the major repairs for our trucking fleet. So our elevators handle about, uh, this is just a historical average, but about 22.2 million bushels of grain a year and about 3.1 million bushels of that is soft wheat. And on a typical year, about 100% uh, of that wheat goes to our flour mills. Not always, uh, depends on what the market's like, um, but usually all of the wheat our elevators handle go to the flour mills. Our mills, and this is all five mills, grind about 27.6 million bushels of wheat a year. Um, that equates to about 1.2 billion pounds of flour uh, that is a lot of Pillsbury biscuits. Um, in Ohio, so Fostori and Bucyrus, our mills grind about 12 million bushels of soft wheat a year. Uh, that equals about 33,000 bushels a day, uh, or 500 acres, roughly, of soft wheat ground daily at our flour mills in Ohio. So we chew through a lot of wheat yearly. Um, so, next. The flour milling process. I'm not a flour miller. I know a little bit about it, um, so I'll speak to that, but uh, I'll give you what I know. And if you have any other questions, we certainly can uh, try to get them answered. So wheat comes in, it's segregated by class, whether it's the local soft wheat or the hard and spring wheat that we rail in, and then it's segregated by quality, typically vomitoxin or falling number. It depends on what kind of issues we're seeing on any given year. Uh, the wheat's then put into storage, um, as the wheat's brought closer and closer to the mill, it's segregated further until we get it to the exact specifications that we need. Um, and then the wheat is tempered. And what we do when we temper wheat is we actually add moisture back to the wheat. Um, it's soaked in water for anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. This makes the milling process easier. It helps us separate the brand coat from the endosperm, which is what actually holds the flour that you use every day. Um, Next is milling. Uh, the wheat is sent through nine to 10 breaks. It's milled nine to 10 times. It's sifted, sorted, segregated, cleaned, and you finally have your flour product. The flour product is then loaded onto either bulk rail containers, bulk trucks, or it's bagged in 50 pound bags and put on a pallet and shipped. Um, I don't know the percentage breakdown, but by far I think the largest um, business that we do is bulk rail. Um, both on the NS and the CSX. Um, then the flour goes out to bakeries, mixed plants, um, you name it, throughout the Midwest, throughout the country. It even goes to, uh, we sell flour to a vodka distillery in Columbus, um, which is pretty cool. Okay, flour, that's our, uh, our bread and butter. The list you see up there is, is some of our biggest flour customers, names that you probably recognize, General Mills, 
Smucker's, Wholesome Specialty Bakery, Baptista's, Kellogg, Interbake. Chances are, no problem. <laughs> Chances are every single person in this audience has had Manel milling flour in some way, shape, or form. And to test this, you'll notice at the bottom there, little Debbie snack cakes. I would like everybody in, there, in the audience, if you've never had a little Debbie snack cake, so an oatmeal cream pie, a fudge round, um, a Swiss cake roll, if you've never had one of those, raise your hand. Really? You ruined my whole, my whole thing. I would advise you to have a Swiss cake roll. They're heavenly. I should have brought some. Darn, that didn't work very well. Um, so yeah, uh, chances are you guys have had Manel Manny Flour. Um, you can see the list of products, Becky, Betty Crocker Cake Mix, Little Debbie Snack Cakes, Rolled Gold Pretzels, Gordon's Fish Sticks, Cal Can Dog Food. The list goes on and on. You will never see our name on the shelf, but we're there. Uh, grocery stores nationwide, Manel Manny products are there. And most of the wheat comes, or most of the flour is from Faustoria, from locally grown soft wheat in Ohio. Um, flour types. In order to get our flour and all of the products that I just listed, uh, we make over 200 types of flour. Um, for example, we may blend 60% soft wheat with 40% spring wheat. Um, to get the perfect protein mix for a Betty Crocker cake box. Um, I don't know if that's the actual breakdown. Like I said, I'm not a miller or a baker. Um, on top of that, we put additives in the flour. They can be bleached, chlorinated, enriched. We heat treat flour where it's superheated with steam. It lowers the microbe count. Um, and that's really useful in, in things like cookie dough ice cream. You have a low risk flour. Uh, that's put into the cookie dough that's not cooked, um, and consumers eat that um, in their cookie dough ice cream. This leads to hundreds upon hundreds of different types of products that we produce from wheat. The moral of the story is that we have huge variability in all of our products, and that variability requires extreme uniformity on our inbound wheat. <laughs> to accomplish this, we have a very extensive research and development department uh, at Manel Milling. We have several PhDs and master's degrees dedicated to working on the uniformity of our wheat and flour products. They continually look for ways to mill a more uniform flour. They also look in years like this where we have a, a bad, bad's a, a light, light term, but where we have a a bad crop, they look for ways that we can utilize this poor crop and still meet the specs of our flower customers. They also look for ways to maximize profitability by utilizing low cost substitutes. For example, if a blend requires a 60-40 blend of soft and spring wheat, um, but they realize they can add 15% hard wheat to substitute for the spring wheat and the spread on the board of trade between Minneapolis and Kansas City is favorable, they'll look to ways to do that to minimize our cost. And we also have a one-of-a-kind pilot mill located in Faustoria. Manel customers demand the highest quality in their flour orders. And they need something else too, flexibility. A way to customize flour to their specific and changing needs. This is more than some millers can handle, but not Manel. We've made our reputation as a supplier that always meets our customers' unique expectations. And our new Faustoria pilot mill is one of the big tools that helps us. Recently, we showed you the pilot mill as it was being built. Now, Ed Tenhako tells us about how the pilot mill is being used. The purpose of the pilot mill is to better understand how to control our milling process so that we can consistently deliver the product that our customers are looking for. In 2009, the components for the mill were shipped to Faustoria. And in 2010, the three-story building to house the mill was completed. In the summer of 2011, the final installation of the mill was completed. The original design of the pilot mill was to uh, mill smaller samples of wheat, uh, batches of wheat. But we wanted to increase the capacity and bring the pilot mill more in line with what we're doing on a production basis. So we made a lot of changes, um, including things like increasing the horsepower of the motors, 
We added a new sifter. We changed the mill flow, added a lot of automation to control the mill. And so it's taken a lot of work from our millers, our automation department, our maintenance department. They've done a lot of good work to bring that all together. There is a next step. We want the pilot mill to perfectly mimic the production mill. This is a slow, careful process, but it's on schedule to be completed soon. It's really important for our pilot mill to resemble our production mill because it makes um, applying the research a lot easier. There's a lot of variables in the milling process and that, that really affect the final product. Um, so if we can get closer with the pilot mill to the actual process, it makes transferring the results to a real world setting a lot easier. Ed says that the pilot mill not only helps in customization and delivery, but also in research. Pilot mill helps Minol with our research because it gives us capability that we didn't have before. Uh, you know, we have a, we've had a smaller experimental mill that's good for milling small batches of wheat and looking at the different varieties of wheat, how they perform. But the process is, is really different than what the production mill is like, and it's generally pretty fixed. With the pilot mill, we've built a lot of flexibility into it so we can change the conditions, change things like the grinding action, the sifting, uh, the temperature, the humidity of the, of the room, and see how that affects the milling process. With the pilot mill, we're able to bring over the same tempered wheat that's being sent to the production mills so we can grind hard winter, hard spring, and soft wheats. Customers come to Manel with what ifs. The Fostoria Pilot Mill is the way Manel answers those questions. Other millers don't offer you this kind of advantage. To find out more, contact Manel today. Okay. So I just wanted to show you that to show how much science goes behind uh, the wheat that gets delivered to our elevators. Um, I just wanted to really quick kind of go out on a limb here. And most of you know that wheat tends to get a bad rap compared to corn and soybeans in the area. Um, sometimes that might be justified, I don't know. Um, but when you look at comparing the hundreds of types of flour that we mill, um, and you compare that to what an ethanol plant does with corn, where they take corn, they grind it, and they spit out 98% alcohol ethanol, you can see that the quality uniformity is imperative to millers so that we can confidently blend wheat to a satisfactory product for our customers. Okay, I'm going to circle back a little bit here and uh, kind of get to where you guys know um, from the elevator perspective at least and get to the inbound wheat. So at our flour mills, we run all the standard tests, test weight, moisture, dockage, damage, insect damage, shrunken and broken kernels. Um, we run all those tests. Also, every load gets tested for vomitoxin as well as falling number. Um, those are rejectable levels. Our contracts have specs on that. We also test for protein. Um, we have a machine called a NIR, a near-infrared machine that tests for milling quality. Um, these are all things that we run on every load of wheat that comes into our flour mills. Um, now I want to dive into vomitoxin and then falling number, um, which is kind of what we're here for a little bit, I think. Um, so vomitoxin is caused by fusarium. Most of you guys know about vomitoxin, I think. It occurs most commonly during flowering especially when there's a rain, too much moisture, it's hot and humid. Um, the spores splash up from decaying vegetation during a rain. Those spores may latch onto the wheat head. Um, and if conditions are right, it'll infect the wheat berry. Um, I put no-till up there. Is it a problem? I don't want to go into a lot of detail. I'm not going answer to answer that. But I think that we have seen a little bit of a correlation between widespread no-till practices and the presence of VOM in our wheat crop. Um, that's, that's a question for agronomists to handle, not me, but uh, I just wanted to point that out. Um, vomitoxin can also affect different parts of the wheat berry. Typically, it affects the bran, which is the outer coating of the wheat berry, um, but it can, in certain instances, affect the endosperm, um, and that's where it causes us big problems because we grind the wheat. Um, we're thinking that we're taking the vom out and the bran, but it turns out it's in the endosperm, and so it's in the flour. Um, it can also affect the germ. Um, which tends to not to be too much a problem. Um, so what does vomitoxin mean for us? On the flower side, we have to have a max of a 1.0 part per million on the vom. That is mandated by the FDA. We don't have a choice. It has to be that way. 
middlings max, so wheat mids are the byproduct of the flour milling process, so the bran, the germ, all the nitty gritty that we don't want in the flour. Its max is 5.0, and they have that because middlings typically go to wheat or to animal feed. Um, our mills usually have a 2.0 max on the VOM that we buy um, in wheat. Uh, sometimes it depends on the year, it depends on what the market's like. Sometimes we'll go up to a 2.3. Um, it just depends. Um, and we feel comfortable accepting wheat at a 2.0 that we can provide a product that's um, on the flour side, we'll have a maximum of a 1.0 on the VOM. Our grain elevators, usually we don't have a max on VOM. We'll, we'll discount growers for vomitoxin. Uh, we like to take it as much as we can uh, to help producers out. Um, sometimes we have to draw the line, but we usually at the elevators will take as much as we can of high VOM wheat. Um, one thing I wanted to note before I go on to following number is the linear relationship when you blend low and high VOM wheat. Uh, most of the guys in here are from the elevators, you know about this, but if you take 1,000 bushels of 1.0 VOM wheat and 1,000 bushels of 2.0 VOM wheat and mix it together, <laughs> you'll more than likely have a 1.5 VOM wheat, 2,000 bushels. Um, as I'll discuss when we get to following number, that relationship is not linear and it doesn't work out that way, so keep that in mind. Following number, um, obviously this is a hot topic this year. Um, I'll go into harvest later, but uh, falling number sprouted wheat this year was a huge issue in Northwest Ohio. Not so much down south, there were still some issues, but uh, in this neck of the woods, uh, falling number wheat, uh, low falling number wheat was a big concern. Um, so falling number test is actually a proxy test to detect the alpha amylase enzyme in a wheat berry. Um, the true test of this enzyme is called the amylograph. The myelograph takes about an hour to run, so it's not feasible to run at the probe stand. So we run the falling number test, which is a pretty good indicator of the enzyme activity. Um, the presence of that enzyme is detrimental for baking, but it's critical and crucial for the regermination of wheat. Um, this makes sense. Um, the alpha is present during regermination. Um, it leads to, it's, it's what shows that the wheat is sprouted. Um, if you bake a cake with low falling number wheat, um, it will be gummy and chewy and not very good. Uh, if you have a fish batter, um, you put the, dip the fish in the fish batter, throw it in the fire, the fish batter will separate from the piece of fish. Um, if you add a, a thickener to soup, uh, the soup will be gummy and pasty and it won't be thick and smooth like you want it to be. So falling number on the baking side is, is a huge, huge issue, which is why on the inbound wheat side, we have to be so, so picky about it. Um, our flour mills use it to detect, to detect sprouting, like I said, and you know this, but when wheat's mature in the field and it can't be harvested, especially when there's rain, the sprouting will occur whether you can see it or not. Um, the falling number test, uh, there's some problems with it. Not very many elevators are set up to run falling number tests. It typically costs between twenty and thirty thousand dollars for the equipment to run the test. You have to buy a grinder and then the test itself. Uh, the initial fees are between twenty and thirty thousand um, dollars, and you have to ask yourself what kind of return on investment can you get at get at the elevator level um, on that kind of investment. Um, this poses a problem for elevators. They may think they're taking in good wheat. They can't see any visible sprouts, or if they do see sprouts, they think they can knock it off in the dryer. Um, but when they deliver wheat to the, uh, to the mill and we run the following number of tests on it, that proves otherwise. Um, so so that's, that's all I had on the following number. Bob, does anybody have any questions about that? Easy. All right, I have another video to show. And I'm After each local wheat harvest, grain elevators get busy. Trucks arrive to have their grain evaluated for purchase. And the efficiency of that process has a big impact on the workflow of the entire mill. Manel's Fostoria plant has recently added a new state-of-the-art grain receiving center. Daily wheat testing and purchase has never been more streamlined. Grain accountant Drew Manel told us more about the new receiving point. Our new grain receiving center offers us 
the ability to get trucks in and out much quicker. Before we would have to probe the truck, get it to sample, do some various quick tests, bring those samples over to the lab, and then do more tests, and then the truck would be allowed to dump. Our new center really offers one location for doing all of the inbound grain tests. We check for the moisture, the protein, as well as falling number tests and vomit toxin tests. We do it all in one location. The truck is there waiting, ready to go. As soon as he gets the green light, he dumps, he goes. Constructing the building took about three months to get the building up ready for, for equipment to start moving in, and then probably a total of 10 to 11 months to bring cameras in, get all the testing equipment inside and installed. Our new receiving center allows us to significantly improve our grain segregation. Better segregation allows us to give our flower customers a much more uniform product. We believe that this grain receiving center is one of the most advanced grain receiving centers that we have in the industry. The Fostoria Grain Receiving Center is another way that Manel is raising the bar for quality and efficiency in the milling industry. To find out more about our grain receiving and testing standards, contact Manel today. Quality, uniformity, service. The Manel Milling Company. So before I go on, I forgot to make the point about blending falling number wheat. Um, like I said, vomitoxin is a linear relationship, but when it comes to falling number wheat, um, if you take the same example and you have a um, 200 falling number wheat, 1,000 bushels, and 1,000 bushels of 300 falling number wheat, um, and blend them together, you'll have 2,000 bushels of a 205 or 210 falling number wheat. At least that's what we've seen on our end. Um, it's a lot harder to blend. We've, we've had a lot of people that have blended low and high falling number wheat and turned all of their wheat into low falling number. Um, it's a problem that we're still trying to work on. Um, we haven't really found an answer for it. Uh, the best we can determine is try not to blend low falling number wheat with high falling number wheat. Okay, harvest this year. Um, for the most part, farmers got it in the ground great in fall. Um, it wintered pretty well. We had good snow cover despite some frigid temperatures for, for a good portion of winter. Um, it came out of wintering great. Uh, there wasn't very much winter kill. There wasn't much risk of frost damage. Um, started growing. It, it looked really good. And then June hit. Um, we had huge rainfall amounts, um, record amounts for most of the state. Um, I think almost everywhere I researched in the state of Ohio was in the top 10 uh, wettest Junes that we've ever had. <coughs> um, some producers were able to take wheat off before the 4th of July. Uh, as, I'll, as I'll point out here in a little bit, that wheat still is proven not to be very good. And most of the wheat that was harvested after the 4th where we received some more rain was is basically unusable, at least in flour milling. Um, <coughs> This year, obviously, we have some falling number issues, poor falling number results, um, but we're also having poor alpha amylase results, which is the enzyme that, that the falling number test um, actually um, results in. So typically, if you have a 300 falling number sample, you mill it into flour and you run the amylograph on it, which detects that enzyme, you'll have a 400 amylograph, which is really good. This year, if we have a 300 falling number wheat, we mill it, and we test the, test the biograph on it, we have a 200 a myelograph, which is not good. Uh, so we're taking in wheat at a 300 falling number, milling it, and that flour can't meet the specs of our customers. We have a lot of customers that have an myelograph spec, and even the ones that don't, um, we'll ship them flour and they'll say, hey, this isn't usable. What, what was the myelograph on it? Um, so it's a, it's a very, very difficult year this year. We're not, it's not even, it's not normal. It's not historically normal. Um, even wheat that we're thinking is good is just not. We did have some bomb issues, um, not, not too bad. We, we, in Northwest Ohio, seem to miss the rains at flowering. Um, we have seen some bomb down in the upper Sandusky area, at least at some of our elevators. Um, we've had some high bomb, but for the most part, that's not an issue. Um, and this does pose a problem for feed wheat. If, if you have bomb in it, some, some elevators took in wheat 
that was heavily sprouted thinking they could get rid of its feed, but feed wheat does have some bomb specs. Um, so it may be difficult to get that off your hands. Um, I just wanted to share this picture with you. This was um, a friend of mine that uh, works at one of our elevators in Nevada. He sent me this picture in a text on the on July 2nd. And uh, I put, Jay, we have a problem, but he had some other words in the text. Um, I won't say them, especially since I'm being recorded. Uh, but you can see um, that weed is not just sprouting, it's growing right out of the head. And, and you, after, after the fact, you saw pictures like this pop up all over the place. Um, so what can we do to help this problem? Um, you know, weather's a lot, a lot of times out of our control. Um, we at Manel Milling at all of our elevators off, um, offer a wet wheat program where we take a shrink only discount. We don't have drying charges. Um, we'll also adjust the test weight up if the test weight is, is low. Uh, we do this to give the producer an incentive to get in the field and get it out of there. Uh, the sooner we can get it in our hands, we can get it dried, we can get it in the bin, get air on it, get it conditioned, um, the better. Uh, the sooner you get out of the field, the less chance you have of getting a rain that's going to prevent you from getting it cut. Um, it's been very successful for us. Producers like it. We like it. Um, we've seen far less problems um, on inbound wheat for falling number using these programs. Wheat's future. Um, I think that's what we're here to discuss today. Um, Manel Milling, we've been around for a long time. We have plans to be around for a long time in the future. A big part of that is the, the soft wheat crop in Ohio. We do know that wheat acres have been declining, and this year is certainly not going to help that. I was telling somebody um, earlier before we got started that we were rolling contracts for, for guys this year, and a lot of times I'd say, hey, I'll roll you a contract and maybe add a premium to it for next year, and they just said, well, I'm not raising wheat next year. And it's pretty scary. Um, it's a challenge, and, and I'm not sure if I have the answer, but I know that uh, this industry is pretty resilient, and I hope that we can come up with something. It's also really important to Ohio's economy. If you think about all of the farmers, all of the transportation companies that move grain around, all of the millers in the area, it's not just Manel Milling. Um, if you think about all the logistics, like I said, on the flour side, both rail and truck, um, and then the bakeries, there are several bakeries in Northwest Ohio, there are thousands of jobs that rely on soft wheat. So not only is it important for our industry, but it's important for Ohio. Um, that's all I have. Don't forget the hard ones go to the back if you have any questions. have had some ethanol plants use that in the past. Is that what you're referring to? Oh, I don't know. Um, Dave, did you hear that question? He asked if the low falling number wheat, while it's detrimental to baking, would it have a benefit on the distillation process, so the vodka distillery? So we'd, we could get rid of it in 20 years. <laughs> but probably not even then. Good question, though. Anybody else? What moisture level do you recommend storing wheat with bomb pumps in that? Stop any potential growth? Um, dry. I, I, I don't know a, a recommended level. I mean, all, all of our elevators, obviously, we'd take the wheat in and we'd dry it down to, to 13 and a half, and that seems to take care of it. Um, I don't know if anybody has any comments on that.
Yeah. If they put it in the bin and maybe keep it a little bit wet, then, yeah. Um, I don't know if we've seen that at any of our elevators. Um, we do have a couple of facilities that, that have wheat f that's several years old. Um, I don't know if we've seen it decrease in our case, um, but I, I would believe it, I guess. Don? I would say at least half. What's the question? He asked what percentage of wheat acres that we harvest or that we produce or we grind in Ohio is unusable this year. He said 50%, I would say at least that, especially in northern Ohio. Have you been able to track genetics at all to see if there's a difference in, in genetic sources as far as the following number of the mom crop? There's not been a whole lot of it done for falling number, but but we at Manelman, we do have a preferred cultivar list of wheat that we know performs well on the milling side. And I know there's a lot of a lot of seed companies, and a lot of uh, extension offices are working on on vom resistant varieties, um, maybe a variety that matures earlier, so that you can get it out of the field quicker. So it's less time in the field um, to be exposed to to rains that may cause sprouting. Um, so there is some merit to that, yes. Where is that available? Uh, our cultivar list is available on our website, manel.com, okay. as well as each of our elevator websites. So we have a preferred cultivar list for our elevator in Virginia as well. So that is available online. Um, there's, there's several, uh, the, it's, it's, I don't know, I would say maybe 50 preferred cultivars um, per region. So we have one for Northwest Ohio and one for, I think, Southern Ohio and then Indiana and, and so forth. Yes. Is there any incentive to grow one of your preferred varieties so how, other than that it should perform better for the grower, but as far as a monetary incentive? There is not. On, on the preferred variety list, there's no economic or monetary incentive, no. It's just a list that we put out there that we have known in the past that may, whether it yields better for the farmer or if it performs better on our end, um, but there's no monetary incentive to that. We'd be in big trouble. Um, we'd be in big trouble if it happened again. Um, even this year, we're pulling a lot of wheat not from Ohio. We're getting wheat out of Kentucky, Tennessee, a lot of wheat out of the southeast. Uh, our elevator in West Point, Virginia, all that wheat typically goes to Roanoke. We're railing that up to Fostoria this year. Um, if it happened again, we, we would be in, in pretty big trouble. I mean, we'd have to do some even more crazy moves um, so I know a guy I work with, Grover, many of you probably know him, Grover Van Hoos, and he's been in the industry for a long time, and this is the worst wheat crop he's ever seen. Now, I've only been around for five years, and it's the worst I've seen, obviously, but we hope it just doesn't happen again. And the, I got the guy in the back then, you. Um, I haven't heard too much of a problem about that. Uh, we, we work closely with a, with a seed uh, company, and I don't think that they're having too much problems. In fact, I think sometimes, I don't know a whole lot about seed, I'm not, I don't deal with that too much, but it seems like some of this wheat that may have some sprout in it is not that detrimental on the seed side, but I don't know. I haven't heard any, any um, concerns about seed availability. You have a question? Where's the seed wheat market? How do you get rid of all those things? Um, Depends. Uh, I'd like to sell some to Kalmbach, but uh, <laughs> it just depends. Um, but it, it turns out that even then, even these feed wheat markets, some of this wheat is so poor that they can't even use it. 
Um, we, we've looked around a lot because we have a lot of wheat that's unusable. Um, you know, it depends. You can rail it to the southeast. Um, there's some local markets in Ohio, some feeders that may use it. But uh, like I said, the bomb can be a problem as well. That's, that's maybe a bigger concern on their end. Yes, sir. Jake, uh, on the falling number, mm -hmm. just trying to get some perspective on this. Is it a problem that you would expect to see about, you know, once every 10 years, once every 15 years? Uh, is it happening more frequently than it was you know, a couple of decades ago? What is the problem with that? Um, this, we had a problem two years ago with falling number on, if you guys remember. I think around the 4th of July, we had like 10 inches of rain in, in a week or something like that. So we had a problem then. I don't think it's, t I think it's more of like a once every 10 years problem. But in the past three years, we've had it twice. So, and so much of it's just weather dependent. I mean, when you get these rains that are poorly timed, that's when it becomes an issue. And that's why we try, like I mentioned, with those wet wheat programs to incentivize the farmer to get it out of the field, if we can. Anybody else? Don? Yeah, just one point of question. With uh, all the, the wheat less than the quality of the corn that's in the show, mm -hmm. does that then make the delivery market unusable to you as a, as a miller? It does, um, because the delivery market doesn't have a spec for falling number, as far as I know. There's no falling, Miller, falling number spec in the delivery market. Um, so it, it can be a problem, yeah. We good? Anybody else have anything? Oh, you had something here. You sure? Okay. Thank you.